Good morning, still, everybody. Yes. I want to try and do this slightly differently. I've got no slides, so we're going to run real ransomware. And what I wanted to do was keep it informal, uh, give opportunities for everyone to ask questions. I've actually invited one of our partners, uh, Zach up, um, who uses Threat Locker for a little over a year now, over a year? Yes, sir. So um, uh, to kind of help me with this and show what it's looked like in his environments when he's tried to run ransomware or his clients have tried to run ransomware, what it looks like. We're going to just run ransomware on various different settings and show you what it looks like when it's blocked, show you what it looks like when it's allowed and ring fenced, and show you lots of other things. I would suggest, if, you, if you're connected to the Wi-Fi, you make sure your firewall's enabled, because we're not running fake ransomware, we're running Real are answer. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and it should be contained because we've got it on VMs and everything. Right. So, Zach, maybe you, you want to start off just giving a little bit about your business uh, as an MSP, what, what you're doing for security and... Absolutely. Um, hey, guys. Thanks for being here. Um, so, we're NetTech Consulting. We're based out of Texas. Uh, we've been around for 19 years. Uh, we do a lot of what you all do every day. Um, we met Danny at a Robin Robbins show back in May of last year, and uh, it, was, um, it was kind of that light bulb moment for us. We realized that um, this was kind of the way forward. We've had clients in the past be hit by ransomware, so for us it was a very um, personal thing. And so um, after getting to know Danny and his team, um, we, like I said, we've, we've uh, we protect over a thousand endpoints, and for us, it helps us sleep at night. I mean, that's really, that's really the value here. So, so I, I think how many of you were here this morning on the session we did this morning? Have we got pretty new rooms, about half the room. So, one of the things I finished off with on this morning's presentation was talk about the zero trust and where the market's going with zero trust. And we talked about NIST and CIS and all of the, the standards that are saying you should use application whitelisting, you should implement zero trust, and the new White House executive order, which I know means nothing. Uh, and then even we showed an example of a ransomware attacker and them giving advice, saying if you'd done this, you wouldn't have got ransomware after the person paid the ransom. So the zero trust, the idea of least privilege is the way forward. Uh, if you're my background's in enterprise, and just so everyone knows, I've been on red teams, blue teams, uh, those kind of things, so, and I've done a lot of penetration testing and a lot of breaking into companies on their behalf intentionally, not as the bad guy, but as someone engaged to come in. But one of the things that I always found is the less privileged, the, the more a zero trust framework is adopted, the harder it is to achieve. Uh, what we want to do here is just give you some examples of what happens when someone tries to run ransomware. So we've got, uh, Zach's got an environment set up, I've got an environment set up. I want to show you, well look, this is obviously the whitelisting approach, and that's the first principle of zero trust. Don't let anything run, because every time something can run, every time you open a program on your computer, whether it's ransomware, or whether it's Office, or whether it's Angry Birds, or SolarWinds, that program can access everything that you can access to. It doesn't care if you're an admin or not, it has no relevance. So don't let anything run that doesn't need to run, that's the first principle we want to follow here. And maybe you want to, sh do we want to plug up your computer sure. first? Or, and we'll, uh, yeah, absolutely. We'll pull out some real ransomware, we'll try and run it, and this part's pretty boring. It tries to run, it gets blocked, but then we'll start allowing it and see what happens. Uh, just a disclosure, no data will be harmed in the making of this video, so just stand by, please. Although, if, uh, Zach has a cool script on his rubber ducky if anyone wants to plug it into their computer. Yeah, f uh, free takers, yeah. <laughs> Can't disclose what it does. <laughs> yeah, you'll find out later. The good news is we've got 45 minutes, so if it takes five minutes to, to get Windows to start. It's... <laughs> the internet's really fast here as well, so this should run smooth. <laughs> this guy tells really great jokes if you haven't figured that out yet. Yeah. So, all right, so can everybody see my screen? All right, great, perfect. Okay, so I'm going to um, show you guys, this is an RDP environment. Now, true story, by the way, when Zach did this first, he forgot to enable security on Threat Locker uh, <laughs> on his own computer. <laughs> so uh, we kind of worked through this process. Hopefully we get it right this time and uh, Zach's files stay alive. <laughs> Absolutely, no, that's not what happened, but I'll let him, let him think that's what happened. So, um, ooh. Sorry, I talk loud. 
Um, yeah, so as you guys can see here, this is um, all our awesome ransomware that we downloaded. We have Bad Rabbit, Cerber, Phantom, Croton, Petya, uh, WannaCryptor, just all the, all the classics that I know all of you in the audience have heard of. Um, as you can see, so here's, here's our files here. It says, please no encrypt me. It's the same file um, throughout. If you put that at the top of every document, it will never get encrypted. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Actually, true story, a lot of ransomware will not encrypt your file if you put Russian characters in it, so you could also do that. Right, this is true. Uh, because Russia does prosecute people who write ransomware that encrypts local files, just not American files. So if you put some Russian language at the top, it might work as well. It's an alternative if you want to save a few dollars a month on your antivirus. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Sorry, Danny. I need to get into ThreatLocker here. Remember I told you I don't know my password? So. Uh. Sorry for the delay, everyone. Please stand by. So if you want to see an interesting hack using a password manager later on, join our hacking class. We're going to show you how to write rubber ducky scripts. We're going to show you how I hacked the MSP and got his RMM password and put an RSAT tool on him. And we're going to show you how we embarrassed him heavily in front of his team as well, with his permission. I don't think he expected to lose, but uh, so it, we're going to show you how to do that later on. OK, so this is just a couple. This is our VM. It's currently in secured mode or monitor mode? It's in secure. Oh, it's in monitor. So we want to it's in monitor mode right now. So if we run this ransomware, it will absolutely um, do it. So um, let's go ahead and, and do that just real quick so that you guys know that these are real files and not just you know, stuff ra named after ransomware. So let's go ahead and uh, let, let's, let's do a throwback here and let's run the WannaCryptor. If only all ransomware was this difficult to get executed. <laughs> hey, old familiar face here. Anyone ever oh. seen this screen before? Oh, yeah. And this asks for the paltry sum of $300 worth of Bitcoin. Because back great. then it was. It's great bucks. when your stock calls you and says, hey, we've, we've suspected suspicious acti found suspicious activity on your network. And you say, I know. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. So um, again, so you look here, um, everything's encrypted now. Um, that's a lot of fun. Um, and then the really great thing about WannaCry is that it then goes in and deletes your original files that it already trashed. So you, it makes a copy of the files, encrypts them all, and then trashes the originals. So you're really out of luck at that point. But we'll just go ahead and let this run through just a little bit here as you'll, you'll watch these files get deleted. And then while we're doing that, I'll go ahead and come back over here to our snapshot engine. True, true, true fact. Most, I would say, public holiday weekends, we see three or four times more attempted ransomware than any other weekend, Garrick. So when you're drinking beer, these guys are at work. Right. Absolutely. So now Especially we're the American holidays when the Europeans are working still. Exactly. <laughs> So we're going to revert this snapshot here. And then all is forgiven, and we're back to clean slate. So stand by while the snapshot reverts. Now, these are some of the older ransomwares. The new ones upload your data as well. But if we tried to upload the data here, we'd just kill the internet for the entire building. So we decided that was a bad idea. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to reconnect here, and while we're waiting for that, I'm going to put ThreatLocker in. So I just want to show you guys real quick. Um, so ThreatLocker has some great options here. Um, you can secure, you can put your um, endpoint in installation mode, uh, learning mode, monitor, uh, or advanced, which uh, we you know go into later. But let's go ahead and secure it. So if, if Zach had wanted that ransomware to be allowed in his environment, he could have put it into learning mode, ran it, and then it would have let it going forward. But 
You, put it in you, you definitely don't want to run ransomware in learning mode because then ThreatLocker will learn the ransomware DLLs. So um, but let's, uh, let's get in here. Okay, so we're back to normal here. All's forgiven. Um, and let's go ahead and, and go to it here. So I just want to make sure. All right, so it's secured. Come back over here. All right. And so now we're going to run our ransomware. Does anyone from the audience have a preference? Somebody want to pick something for me? Anyone? Which one? Petya. Petya. All right. Very good, my man. Petya. All right. So we're going to run Petya. Microsoft trying to give you the last, last reprieve here. And you say, yeah, I'm good. I'm just going to run it anyway. Boom. Look at that. To protect you with our with our you nice, can, you can drag that here. up if you want to drag it out of the way. Yeah. So the nice thing too, guys, is Threat Locker is 100% brandable to your MSP. So one of the things that we really liked about this is it kept it present, kept us present of mind with our customers. Um, not that they need any more reminding of who we are, but it's it's awesome because it keeps them in their head, like, hey. These guys are really looking out for me. Yeah, this is annoying. Yeah, it takes time, but they're protecting us from basically everything. So Zach put his logo on there, uh, and it looks cool. We had one client, he put a picture of himself on there. If you want, <laughs> if you want to freak out your clients, you can put your face on there. I mean, I, I thought that was a bit strange, but yeah. Exactly. I'm not an MSP, so I don't know best. So now I'm going to run this here, and then I'm going to click Request Access. So what you'll see, this is what your end users will see, OK? Um, and this has uh, been with Danny a long time now. We're, this has improved significantly and is always improving. So he's always trying to make it easier for us, the cybersecurity professionals, to deliver awesome support and service to, your, to our clients. So um, you see this text box here that asks you why do you want it? It's actually optional. Uh, we have a lot of monitors on our system. So if we get an unusual amount of computers checking in, too many hot, too high, too low, we've got parameters of where we start getting red lights flashing on our dashboard, just like you do with your client servers. Uh, one of those parameters is how many approval requests have come in in a certain period of time, because we expect so many requests coming in. Um, it was about six months ago we added the option box saying, why do you want this? And the amount of approval requests dropped so much, it was over 80%. It freaked out our operations center. They were like, there's something wrong. The approval requests aren't working. What's going on? People stopped requesting when they had to say, why do you want Steam on your laptop? Right. I don't really have a good reason, so I'm just going to hit cancel. And that, it, it made a huge difference. I mean, it, it freaked us out. We thought there was genuinely something wrong with our software. We were testing for hours and hours, saying, these requests are all coming through, but why are they so low? It's not a public holiday. They're just low. But because we have this box that says, why do you want to run some ransomware? Exactly. So, and what's nice, guys, is you can route this to your ticketing system, so it can come in as a ticket. Uh, maybe you have a dedicated person where all they do is handle threat locker requests all day. Um, it's, it's, it's very nice. So, um, so obviously, we're not going to send requests. Uh, we're just going to log in as an admin. So I'm going to log in here. I want to use Internet Explorer. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm good, thanks. OK, so this is what will pop up for the admin. And as you, oh, oops, sorry about that. So as you can see here, um, right off the bat, it gives you the ability to check virus total. So you know, I, I heard a lot of times people would make the argument, well, what if I accidentally whitelist a virus? Well, you're stupid. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'm not going to say that. He can and get away with it because of his great accent, but I, I'm not going to say that. Yeah. So. <laughs> but if you look here, um, again, obviously, wow, it's ransomware, right? You sh shouldn't run this. What, what I think is really cool is the number of antiviruses at the bottom that don't recognize it's ransomware. And the, obviously, this is pretty old. I don't know how old this ransomware is, but it's, it's, it should be pretty much recognized by everyone. I actually have a, a document on my demo environment called Maria Resume. It was sent to us by one of our clients. And I thought the client was asking me, and I was like, 
is this really an MSP? But I think it was actually they just forwarded their client's email. So their client had got an email with Maria's resume. It asked them to put a password in, which they did. They clicked enable macros because that seemed like a logical thing. And then Threat Locker popped up and said, hey, we blocked this. And the customer sent an email to the MSP saying, you're not supposed to be blocking my stuff. Really mad. And the MSP forwarded it on to me. And, I, and I, the way they worded it, I thought the MSP was saying, why are you blocking Office? Now, <laughs> it's like, but it was, why are they sending me this? I've had that on my desktop for well over a year now. It shows us no results found every time I click on it. And by the way, it does encrypt my files. I tested it. Absolutely. Um, so I want to show you guys this here. So this is where you create your application definition. So if you have a, a new application that is completely unknown to the environment, this is where you would, you would do that. So um, we're just going to call this ransomware Petya. And at this point, by the way, you should stop. Yeah, permit it. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, uh, proceed with caution after this. <laughs> yeah, this is us showing what happens when you actually permit ransomware and what you can do beyond just saying, can this run or can it not run? Well, uh, yeah, I think the whole point of this presentation is to show you guys the true power of this Death Star because this software is awesome. Um, not to shill, but anyway. Um, so if you look here, we've got uh, select a rule to create. So today we're just going to create a rule for the application because it's an executable that we're trying to run. Um, but if you were trying to run like another program that has DLLs or makes registry changes, uh, you would click automati uh, automatically catalog using learning mode. So, uh, but we're not doing that today. We're just going to create a rule for the executable. All right. So now, this is where you get to decide the actions of what's running. So, um, obviously, if somebody requests something and you ignore it, then it's going to deny it's going to deny it flat out, right? But if you, um, and you really don't have to do anything because that's the default, but um, if you look at your second action here, permit the application and add ring fence restrictions, permit the application without restriction, and don't create any policies, just update the application definition. So what we're gonna do today, again, to illustrate the power of this, is we're gonna click on permit the application and add ring fencing restrictions. So um, as you can see here, we're gonna, affect it, or we're gonna restrict its ability to access the internet, Write the registry. I, we're gonna, I, where we're picking these, I want to just step what this yeah, is. So please. four states to any application. First one's denied. If it's denied, it can't harm you at all. That's the best state every application should be in, because every application you run is potentially dangerous. Now, of course, we can't deny everything. People want to run Office. They want to run QuickBooks. They want to run Zoom. Uh, so we have to allow certain things. The next state is we can allow this, but we can define exactly what it can do. We can assume that this application is either going to be compromised through no fault of their own, they're going to be compromised through fault of their own, or they're just a bad piece of software. So, I mean, I don't, anyone remember Daemon tools? Yeah, it used to be this cool ISO mounting tool, uh, and then they sold their soul to the devil and pushed out malware with it one day. So we can always assume that, what does this application really need access to? And that's the concept of ring fencing. We can say, does this need access to my files? Does this need access to the internet? Does it need access to change my registry or talk to PowerShell? Right. And this is really useful if you have somebody that absolutely insists, hey, I have to run this software, and you're like, I don't trust it. It's not signed. I've never heard of it. Um, you can come in here and, and absolutely restrict it. Um, the one way I'd like to tell you to think about this in a way is it's almost like being able to put a firewall around every single DLL, executable, registry, everything on the system. It's, it's, it's unbelievable, the power. But um, So we're going we're gonna to move forward here. Um, you can assist the user. So let's say someone's trying to run um, something as an admin. Yeah. Yeah. Give them the admin. If you want to give someone admin privileges to run their ransomware, you absolutely can. Um, this, this helps you because then you don't have to go in and physically provide credentials. And then lastly, and, and obviously the most, in a lot of ways the most important, what are you applying this policy to? So we're going to apply the policy in this case, obviously, to this computer only, because we don't want to allow ransomware ever in any of our environments. But here, we're going to do that. So all right, so we're going to then come through here and save this. So obviously, this page is intended for you guys to permit legitimate software when you have something new in your environment. It's not intended for permitting ransomware. But in this case, because we've done it with ransomware, it's now saying you can run this application, but it's restricted in what it can do. So if you want to, 
that you can run that yet. All right. Within 60 seconds or so, you should be able to run that. Yeah, let's wait. I don't want to be, you know. I think one time I was doing this presentation, and I was so proud of myself, but I accidentally left something. I accidentally left learning mode on. And so when I was showing the client the ransomware ran, I'm like, yeah, so anyway, over here, you know, trying to divert their attention. Because um, if you, like I said, if you let ransomware run with learning mode, you're, you're yeah, kind of defeating the point. But um, all right, Dan, are you close enough, you think? Yeah, I think we'll right, find out in a second. So, okay, so we're gonna come over here and we're gonna run this anyway. And in theory, pretty much not, you checked every box on ring fencing? I did, yeah. So it's gonna struggle to do much. Um, do you wanna pull up the audit? Oh, I don't know how long it takes to go in there, but yeah. I'm sure we've got one from our couple of minutes. What this is gonna try and do now is it's gonna try and encrypt all the files. So we have this definition of protected files. So protected files are your documents, your desktop, your network shares. So that means when you check that box, it can't access those. Uh, we also have the ability to um, define uh, websites. So you can say SolarWinds needs to talk to SolarWinds but not to malicious sites to get instruction. PowerShell needs to go to Office 365 but it doesn't know, need to go to everything else. Um, so we can see here that there's lots of stuff trying to happen and it's being denied because of the ring fencing and we could make exceptions for that. And yeah, so, and, and the thing is like, so one, the, another thing too guys that I wanna make sure we don't gloss over here is this um, universe, unified audit is probably uh, yet another really amazing thing about ThreatLocker. So ThreatLocker logs everything that happens on the machine. Read, write, execute, install, delete. Um, I'm sure I'm leaving things out, Danny. Denies and permits, so if somebody, mm -hmm. I know this never happens, where someone drags a folder into another folder on the file server and it goes missing, and then they call saying the computer ate my files. I know that never happens with, with computer users, but if it does happen, you'll be able to see who did it and where it went. And a young man, Petya is the devil, okay? I'm just, yeah, uh-huh, yeah. I know you picked that one to be difficult, but obviously you wouldn't let Petya, yeah, but Petya still somehow yeah. crashed the machine, <laughs> even with, but yeah. I mean, yeah, anyway. So, um, we're, so we're, what's that? Yeah, right? Oh, man, it's the devil. It is the devil, so. Um, but yeah, so getting back to that unified audit, just to make sure we, I, I don't lose this thought with you guys, is, I mean, it, it gives us so much visibility into the environment. I think it goes back by default, what, 30 days? 30 days is the standard. If you've got a compliance client, so we can technically go up to seven years, cost more money, of course. Um, just an interesting number, we log about three, well, it's probably more than that now. Last time I checked, we log about 300 million rows of data an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, file logs, execution logs, things like that. It's terrifying, and we've seen some really interesting stuff come out over the last few years. Um, I wanted to show one other part of this. I mean, the goal of this is don't let anything run, control what it can do once it's run, and so you, PowerShell can't eat your lunch, so Office can't call PowerShell, all of these things. But there's one other part that a lot of our clients don't use, so for the clients in here, this is probably where you want to pay the most attention, and that is the storage part. Um, so I'm going to switch to my machine just to show you that. Um, yeah. And I'm going to turn off, I'm going to turn Threat Locker into monitor mode, I'm going to run ransomware, I'm going to let it encrypt my files. Not my real files, because that would be dumb. <laughs> but I'm going to get my machine to wake up. Okay. Got to go passwordless, man. That's the new thing. Okay, so um, I'm going to literally switch my machine into monitor mode, so it blocks no application policies. Now there's another part of the login first. I don't know the password. Okay, so if I go into here, I'm gonna say, here, switch this to monitor mode, and one of the features in ThreatLocker is you, on an application control point of view, you can choose which policies apply in monitor mode and which don't. So if you say, if someone turns a machine into monitor mode, I don't want it PowerShell to be able to go out to the internet still, you can do that. But from a storage policy point of view, they're separate. So typically you're gonna do this on a file server. 
where you say, I have a file server and I want to protect that share. In this case, I'm gonna do it on my desktop because I'm using one laptop on Hyper-V. Uh, I'm gonna say, here's my laptop. The only programs that need to access my laptop are Office and Explorer and things like that. So I've literally, there's only three things in there just for my, there's my desktop folder. The only things that can access it are Explorer, these which don't even need to be in there, and Office. We can add multiple things in there. So I'll just go and save that and deploy policies. Now, when I run this ransomware, it's gonna make crap on my machine. But it's not gonna eat, because I didn't ring fence it, it's fully allowed, we're in monitor mode only. Um, but what's not gonna get encrypted, everything else will. So I've got my documents folder, and they've got some files in there. I didn't, I don't think I protected that. I've got my downloads folder, that's not protected. I've got no ring fencing, no whitelisting. Just from a storage point of view, obviously I didn't wait long enough. Or I put the wrong computer in monitor mode. There you go, that'll do it. And now all my files are getting encrypted. My downloads are all being encrypted. My documents are being encrypted. If I find my documents folder, they're all gone. But guess what's protected? Probably the least important folder. Pretend it's a file share. And this is not a picture, guys. This is live and in real time. My desktop folder is protected because I, the reality is even if you have some users that want to be able to run any new software they want, which really isn't a valid business reason for most people, maybe some developers, they're still potentially going to destroy your business. They're still going to access your file shares. They're still going to upload your data. And we're using CryptoLocker because we don't want to upload data here, but you could do the same thing. Um, in this case, we're saying these users this folder is protected. It only needs to be accessed by these, this data. Whether that folder is QuickBooks and only needs to be accessed by QuickBooks or your QuickBooks database and only needs to be accessed by your QuickBooks share, whether it's Veeam and only needs to be accessed, uh, your backup share and only needs to be accessed by Veeam or StorageCraft or Datto, or whether it's um, your office, you can protect them. And you can see my machine's still destroyed on my virtual machine. I hope I didn't run it on my laptop. It's not my real laptop. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you can see here that the machine's still destroyed, but they couldn't get those files. These are all different layers. The idea we want is we want to get to a least privileged environment. We want to only give what is needed and nothing more. The closer we get to deny, the better. We can't always do that, but there are lots of layers in between. Uh, one of the cool features about this, um, the storage policies as well, is on your server, you can actually set it. So if someone comes in with an unprotected laptop, they can't connect to that share. Because that's always an issue, you end up with rogue endpoints around and then they come in and encrypt your files. You can actually set it so they can't talk to that share. If, you're, if you are using ThreatLocker now and you're not looking at the storage, because it always seems to be the last thing people look at, it's relatively simple. You pick a share, you create a policy, you hit auto-populate, it tells you what programs have accessed it, you can remove anything you don't need, and then you lock it down. Even if something's allowed to run, even if it's not ring-fenced, it still won't be able to get access to that data. So do have a look at it if you're not doing that. I think we've got 15 minutes for questions, and hopefully we spark some. You there. Yeah, so when you deploy ThreatLocker for the first time, ThreatLocker goes through and ingests everything that's happening in the environment and makes, so they've got applications that they know about and that they update and maintain regularly, like Office, Zoom, you know, all the big ones, right? Um, and then your clients with their specific set of applications, you, you let that run for pretty much an entire week. Um, actually, it can be faster, two or three yeah, days. It's, it's, it's getting faster. I, and I'm going to repeat the question just for the people watching virtually. So, I, and, and if, I, if I say it wrong or I paraphrase it too much, tell me. But essentially, what you want to know is can you create policies across all of your clients? Uh, the answer, uh, so you don't have to permit for every single person. So there's, there's two answers to that, which is the first one which, where Zach's going. It's going to learn what's in your clients when you onboard. So it's going to tell you this is what we have in these clients. We've created those policies, and we're going to track those updates for that. Um, and then in terms of permitting things globally, of course. So if one of your clients requests access to Grammarly um, and you want to say, hey, Grammarly can be used by all my clients, you can permit that and you can say this can now be used across the board so I don't have to re-add it. And you can also do network whitelist for ring fencing and things like that globally, PowerShell scripts uh, for automate and things like that. Right. Right. 
How are you going? I'm great. Uh, so there's no question that zero trust should be part of your stack, absolutely. But um, what you haven't said today, which I think you should, um, obviously you know I'm a threat locker partner and I happen to be an advocate for the product, an evangelist, so if you want to know anything about it, you can ask me. But um, why should MSPs or MSSPs choose threat locker and not another zero trust product? Um, so, I mean, it's not just because you're the best. Can, you know? can I answer that? Yeah, answer yeah. That? You should choose ThreatLocker because these guys have passion. Like, this man created this company and he's still up here slinging it every single day. Danny comes to work every single day and that's why you should choose ThreatLocker. And on top of that, on top of that, they have a fantastic support team that answers 24-7 within less than a minute. So, sorry. Anyway. So, th th that's, <laughs> that's good. It's less than 30 seconds or someone's getting their ass fired. Right. We'll, we'll deal with that. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, and they're, they're based, we're not outsourcing them offshore. They're based in Florida. They're, they're not just warm bodies. They're warm, able bodies, and they will answer your support questions. Because guess what? We're dealing with complicated issues. I mean, most of this stuff is relatively easy, but sometimes things are just hard. And you've got this weird payroll app. It's always payroll. <laughs> so that's doing this crazy weird stuff. And you need to create an exception for it. So they're there to help you. But outside of that, I think from a feature and functionality point of view, there are whitelisting products out there. There aren't really any targeted towards the MSP industry. But here's where the whitelisting side of this, we win without a doubt. There's 450 applications that we track updates for. Everything from Automate to Zoom to WebEx to Office to Windows. 90-something thousand files we added as part of Windows updates on Patch Tuesday within 30 minutes of them being released uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern time. We do that so you don't have to. White listing zero trust is hard when you have to manage all that stuff. It's not hard when you don't have to do it. So when you have a policy to permit Automate, Automate's going to run tomorrow and today and when they release the next update. When you have a policy to run Windows or Zoom, the same thing applies. So from a feature point of view, that also the ring fencing, I'm pretty sure we're the only people that's doing this ring fencing. I've yeah, never seen anything yeah, close to it. I've never seen it um, anywhere else. But like Zach said, from a support point of view, we are very passionate about security and we are going to be there to help you throughout that's from onboarding to support. We don't charge extra for it. And if I'd like, I want to add something on top of that. So we have some customers uh, where we do co-managed IT, commits as it's being called nowadays. Um, and the really great thing for us is that ThreatLocker will support them when they have an issue so they're not calling us. So just throwing that out there to those of you that, was there a question? Oh, yes, sir. <clears throat> All right, so I'm sure this is kind of basic, but let's no. say I got a new client and okay. they're already compromised and infected. I deployed Threat Rocker. What's that going to look like? I'm assuming it's not going to just learn that behavior and accept that as the norm. I mean, uh, for me, a good rule of thumb is have a clean environment first, then install Threat Locker. So Get it clean. I mean, th that, that's our recommendation. And we've dealt with ransomware. We've got one client, and they make me cry every time I go into their audit, and it has ransomware being denied every single day. And it's like, please remove this from your machines. I know they're always going to pay their bills. Cause <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, we do rec I mean, you, if you're onboarding with an active infection, from a security guy point of view, my, my solution is unplug everything until it's clean. But from a I can't do that point of view, you can do things like not automatically learn across the board. You can manually permit things. We have MSPs that do that. You can restrict things. I remember dealing with an Emotech infection that was just spreading from machine to machine. We dealt with storage policies to lock it down. There are solutions for it. Um, we don't recommend it. And from a security point of view, you're never 100% sure it's gone unless you take extreme actions. So I would always say take extreme actions. Uh, but outside of um, that, there are ways you can do it. And again, they're against advice, but we do it all the time for clients. Go ahead, sorry. Have you got... um, so I've got a couple hundred uh, small clients, small business clients, um, and they're always worried about the cost versus uh, the value of it. So uh, a ten, let's say a 10-person company, um, what would your response be if they said, oh, we've got multiple backups in multiple locations and we wouldn't be affected by this? And I'm just playing devil's advocate because somebody's going to ask me that when I get back. So... Okay, so uh, and I think from a sales point of view, first of all, you'll be surprised how right now, how receptive people are to forced change, and I'm going to use the word forced change, send an email, say we're doing this and we're adding 10 bucks a month, we're going to make eight of that in profit. 
and you'll get massive success, and we're seeing MSPs do this all over the coast. But to respond to your question about the backups, every ransomware account attack I've seen in the last year has involved uploading all of the data to the internet. They will use that data to steal your employee's identity, to do spear phishing campaigns, to try and crypto lock you again, to go after your customers, and you can't get that back. It's one, it doesn't matter whether you pay the ransom or not. That Once that data's gone, it's gone. Um, I think every small business, I'm a CEO too, everyone wants to get money from me. Every employee wants money and every employee wants something. Every small business is gonna push back when you ask them to spend. But at the end of the day, if you, if you put a very compelling case in front of them, if you say, look, look at these ransomware attacks, look at what the federal government's recommending and these guys are recommending and this is recommended. This is, the cost of ransomware has gone from eight to $270 billion in two years. This is what you have to do. So you're gonna pay me an extra $10 a month. I'm gonna pay throughout like an extra couple of dollars a month. To Danny, if I could parlay for a second. Um, young man, you, uh, you pay for antivirus every month, right? Well, your customers do, but you resell it, right? So one of the, um, one of the epiphanies I had when we were going to ThreatLocker, I mean, I'm managing over 1,000 endpoints. What do I do, right? ThreatLocker comes along and says, hey, we're ThreatLocker. We cost this much. Oh. And I'm like, oh, that's great, but how am I going to afford you? And I started thinking, well, do I really need, and I'm not going to name names just to protect the innocent or not, depending on how you look at it. Listen, so do we really need all that on these workstations? And the answer really was no, because, hear me out, we have Windows Defender, right? Windows, and, and the way from, a, from an attack chain standpoint, you download a threat or whatever, right? And the threat goes to run. Windows Defender is going to be the first thing that pops up. And OK, so Windows Defender misses it. Big deal. You know what won't miss it? Threat Locker. So when you're thinking about how can I afford Threat Locker, right, or how can I sell it to my customers, don't. Just do it. Be like, hey, this is what we're doing. Sorry, if you don't like it, well, this is, you know, that's what it is. I mean, that's what we did. You know, <laughs> I got a lot of guff for it in the beginning, but after a month, customers were like, wow, yeah, OK, Threat Locker, good stuff. So that, sorry, that's, I wanted to answer that for you. Do you have uh, some sort of email campaign or email template that actually helps us describe that? I know you've got templates to help us sell, but we're not a SME in Threat Locker. We, we, we just don't have experts in it. You guys are. So do you have any type of uh, email campaign that we can say, look, this is why you need it. We're going to keep your antivirus. I know you've got backups in the cloud. I know you're writing backups to a USB. I, we know all that but here's why you need it. Yeah, so the answer is yes, and we, we update them every month and we have a number of templates. Right now we have a really effective one that talks about the Colonial Pipeline, around JBS Foods, around what's happening. Um, they're pre-drafted, they can of course be edited. Not only do we have them, we have standardized white papers for various industries that we can rebrand as yours. And one of the things that we give our partners that we don't charge for is we give you access to our marketing team. So if you go to them and say, like, we literally had an MSP saying, I need to sell to a plumbing company. Like, what? Can you give me a use case for a plumbing company? And our marketing team went off and created a, a white paper around plumbing parts that had been ransomware, how much they paid, what it meant to their business, and they created it. So they will work with you. On top of giving you the templates, we will work with you to create additional content that you need. The right time to send that email, by the way, and this is what I say to everyone, everyone's nervous about how much uptick can I get in this. Deploy the agent, roll it out, start looking at, during a trial, it's not gonna cost anything. Start looking at what your client, the data's doing, and make sure you're happy with the product, which everybody is happy with the product. Then send the email out, send it out after a week of trying it, get, and then figure out what feedback you get. Right now, it's been the easiest time. Normally people say, well I got 5%, 10% kickback. Right now, every time I've spoken to a client who sent an email out, has had no kickback because they know what it was like not paying an extra dollar for gas on the East Coast. Well, and, and I'd like to add something onto that, right? So if you wanted to maybe give your client like a live reason as to why they need it, you know, like have just in your QBR, right? Be like, hey, Mr. Customer, I want to show you how your antivirus isn't going to stop what's on this thumb drive. And they go, well, what's this? And you say, well, this is a um, USB rubber ducky, right? 
Um, and then you plug it in, you, you, you have your pre-programmed whatever it is that you've done. Uh, th this one particularly, nah, Danny doesn't want me telling. So, but this, I, I'll tell you what this does do. This takes information off the machine and it emails it to me, right? Anyone want to so, plug it in? Anybody? <laughs> no? Smart. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, you, you know, we'll, we'll it won't take the Russian character money there. Right, yeah. But you know what I mean? So you can, you can, you can start there and be like, hey, look, um, your antivirus isn't going to stop this. The threat locker will. Stuff like that. Just little things. Little examples here, there. Go ahead, Cy. Uh, hi. I just thought I'd share a testimonial with you. Um, so we had a, um, someone reach out to us, uh, a manufacturing company, um, two weeks ago. And they followed up, and they have an internal IT person. And uh, they're like, hey, we were patching our windows, but hey, I got this malware on our exchange environment. Uh, and so doing some more investigation and things of that nature, uh, we've determined that it ended up being a uh, hafnium breach, which uh, they originally still have in their environment today, uh, Exchange 2016 RTM, which is October 2016, I believe. Um, and so we implemented what our stack was initially, which was, uh, well, let me take a step back. They, they had gotten notification that their AVG business system picked it up and pulled a ma uh, malware, which was an afterthought of the original breach. Uh, from there, uh, we implemented uh, our, we removed AVG, we put our webroot on it. Webroot didn't see it. So now that's two antivirus systems that didn't pick up that breach. Uh, and then finally, we implemented ThreatLocker, put deny policies around PowerShell and um, CLI uh, for Windows and um, Thankfully, it stopped the breach. So, obviously, there's other things you can do as takeaways. You know, you know, turning PowerShell on, running the update scripts, or you know, patching the system. But, you know, as it stands right now, it's uh, it's preventing that from uh, it's a game changer for you, right? Pardon me. It's a game changer for you, right? It was absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Well, thank you. Um, Hi. Um, just so SOC seem is required by most. A lot of compliances, not all of them. Is is Threat Locker considered a seam the way it's logging and retaining data, or is that I got to do something else on top of that to um, be seam? So we wouldn't market it as a seam, uh, but I mean it collects more data than most seams. <laughs> so uh, I mean it's not typically going to go into your firewall logs. So we're focusing on endpoints and servers, but it's going to collect a lot of data. Um, do you need to invest more? It, it, it depends on your client and how complex they are. Um, typically, the stock part of it is obviously the human part reviewing logs for unusual activity. Um, and it's, 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 um, that's obviously not what we do. Now, I say that's not what we do. We, of course, actually review our own logs every single day. And you can review your own logs every single day to make sure that nothing's unusual happening. And you can set alerts on things as well. So one of the things I recommend, I, I mentioned earlier about that Canadian customer that had someone trying to run ransomware on their server, is if something gets blocked on a server, you should probably notify yourself, because it's either getting blocked for one or two reasons. One is something's configured wrong, or two is someone's trying to do something bad. Either way, it needs to be resolved. Um, so, but, but yeah, I would say we check a lot of the boxes, and I would put a gray check. It's not marketing as, as that, in that it's, it's tracking a lot on the endpoint, more than what most sims would, uh, but it's not tracking your firewalls and things like that. Okay, and then, so my add-on question is, does Threat Locker produce a feed that could be ingested by a syslogger or something along those lines so that I, I can add that to my seam if, if, if so I had can to? We can, we can send, yes, we can yeah. send data to a sim. Uh, okay. So we could send it to um, Splunk or syslogger or, or anything like that. Okay. And we also have open APIs. Okay. I don't know if we're even out of time. Are we? Have we got any more questions? I think we're out of time anyway, so one more? Any more? Okay, cool. So thank you very much, everybody.